A warm good evening from uh, PMS Bazaar. In a world where new geopolitical alliances are formed and the existing ones are tested, sound stock selection continues to remind the best allies for investors to counter formidable foe of volatility in the equity market. From August of uh, 21, the markets were volatile and the market cycles needed to be taken into account to navigate different cycles and it is important when multiple headwinds are affecting the market. To make the volatility your friend, you need a fund manager who understands the cycle to tackle the volatility to create long-term wealth. We have an interesting topic presented by Equirias Wealth Private uh, Limited on market cycles, how to navigate. The keynote speaker to present this contemporary topic is Mr. Viraj Mehta, who is a managing director of Equirias Wealth. He has 13 years of experience in equities, but he worked for well-known organization like Franklin Templeton Investment in an award-winning team. Viraj manages a non-model portfolio of high quality stocks for long-term wealth creation. With an outlandish and the chart topping return of over well over 22% since inception, which is very impressive considering the fund he manages is over five years and seven months till now. I hand over the podium to uh, Mr. Viraj to present. After that, we will take a q and It is over to you, Viraj. No, thank you so much for having me over, uh, Shiva. And I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to uh, your audience and and we just wanted to give a sneak peek about how we think about investments and we are generally a micro investor in the sense we are more bottom up investor and we also wanted to give a flavor see today a lot of investors have a lot of questions regarding the macros the cycles how, how and how what is the best way to navigate about it um, so we just tried to present our thoughts uh, regarding that uh, and I'll be and post a small presentation that we have done. I'll be happy to take any questions uh, all the investors have. So this is probably the most important slide uh, uh, for us. See, uh, whenever people talk about market cycles, we believe that market cycle is not only about forecasting macro circumstances. It's not only about thinking uh, where the reverse or the uh, the repo would be or where the Fed, how many times will Fed hike the rates or where will oil be three years out or two years out or where will steel or aluminum be then. But we believe it is far more important to have deep understanding of the industry fundamentals to appreciate where essentially the business stands in the cycle today. Um, and what price are we paying for it? So let me put it into perspective. So for example, in 2008 or 9 or 13, 14 or 20, there were a lot of companies which went down significantly and they were at a point in the business cycle where a large part of pessimism was in the price. And even though the outlook may not seem great a, a quarter or two out, but the price at which they were trading uh, and the business cycle and the pessimism in the business cycle just meant that those were going to be the significant value creators if something was not broken uh, in a very short period of time. If we look at India's listed space and actively traded listed space of close to 2000 shares, um, not more than 50 stocks actually of reasonable size have compounded investors' wealth consistently over 8 to 10 years. You have also had periods where some of the industry stalwarts, India Inc. stalwarts like HULs and ITCs and Wipros have not created wealth for 5 to 10 years. So we think owning a business for 3 to 4 years and understanding the business cycle becomes even more important because not all stocks or not even 5% of the stocks will keep compounding wealth over, over a decade, which is why it is important to understand a business, business cycle, stock cycle, invest in it at a right time at the right valuation 
and then get out of it when when the when when the valuation and the business cycle is not in your favor also um, uh, we think that a large portion of this understanding also comes from from a very diverse views that we carry across the horizon right from reading uh, us to reading what's happening globally to what's happening in india and and the idea is not to predict the idea is to have what outcomes can come out of a reasonable scenario and have a probabilistic bet on it that this may happen and if this happens what will we make out of it also all businesses and and businesses and markets don't move in a straight line except if you are a bajaj finance and you have had an exceptional uh, business performance of like 10 years where you just keep growing except probably a quarter here and there all businesses go through tough and peak of earnings some have higher cyclicity like much higher cyclicity like steel companies and some have much lower cyclicity like fmcg companies but all earnings in the market are cyclical and it is extremely important to understand that cycle right from commodity to how p of a company can shrink due to the effect of of some of those parameters also operational cycle and valuation cycle are not always in sync and let me take a little bit of time to explain this a lot of people do not understand the nuance that market is probably two quarters or three quarters forward looking so a lot of pessimism gets and optimism gets factored in far quicker so let's say if you are essentially the the uh, right from last 20 years let's say let's take the latest example of covid the bottom of the market was made uh, on 25th of march which was even before like 50 covid cases were registered per day in india but then the bad news kept coming as far as covid was concerned but markets kept recovering i can go example by example let's say cyclical stocks like steel they the stocks fall much before the bad results start coming so market and operational cycle are not always in sync and maximum return is made when essentially the stock is far below its intrinsic value and the performance is below and you pick them up and which is when you make maximum return so the idea we believe is that mean reversion is a is a is a significantly good mental approach or is a is a great me- mental tool to have when you are looking at uh, stocks and businesses and industries and you need to have them as a tool with you when you think about investment uh, from a 3 to 4 year perspective and that is how we think about our investments so you know i would like to run a small clip from a movie called moneyball just to give a little bit of perspective for those who have not seen this movie uh, this movie uh, shows brad pitt as one of the uh, guys or one of the managers who's running a small ball club oklahoma aces um, and there is a big ball club uh, which have larger monies to spend and they are winning championships but what he's trying to find out is is not by the stars which is what we try not to do by the stars which are very richly valued in stock market as well but look at companies which are undervalued but on number basis on business perspective on their their standing in their e- economy or in the standing in the value chain is equally important and there is a way to categorize that so it's beautifully depicted in this scene um, i'll just play it Hello. Who are you? I'm Peter Brand. What do you do? I'm special assistant to Mark Shapiro. So what do you do? Mostly player analysis right now. There is an epidemic failure within the game to understand what is really happening. happening and this leads people who run major league baseball teams to misjudge their players and mismanage their teams I apologize go on 
okay, people who run ball clubs, they, they think in terms of buying players. Your goal shouldn't be to buy players. Your goal should be to buy wins. And in order to buy wins, you need to buy runs. You're trying to replace Johnny Damon. The Boston Red Sox see Johnny Damon and they see a star who's worth seven and a half million dollars a year. When I see Johnny Damon, what I see is is an imperfect understanding of where runs come from. The guy's got a great glove. He's a decent leadoff hitter. He can steal bases, but is he worth the seven and a half million dollars a year that the Boston Red Sox are paying him? No, no. Baseball thinking is medieval. They are asking all the wrong questions. And if I say it to anybody, I'm I'm ostracized. I'm I'm, I'm a leper. So that's why I'm I'm cagey about this with you. That's why I I respect you, Mr. Bean. And if you want full disclosure. I think it's a good thing that you got Damon off of your payroll. I think it opens up all kinds of interesting possibilities. Where are you from, Pete? Maryland. Where'd you go to So, what he was essentially trying to say is that you buy players not for their looks or for how charismatic they are. You basically buy them for what their on-field performances are. And that is not what was happening in US baseball leagues. We also think a large portion of it is actually also not what's happening in India as well. It's, and it's just mental bandwidth of people to look at what is sexy today and what is doing well today, what is in the news today. And you go to buy that. We actually go the reverse way. We look at what is probably not doing well, what is not sexy today but is an exceptionally well-run business, probably going through a troubled time because of A or B reason, which is why you get it at a significantly higher discount to everything else. Also, when you do this over and over again, you're not going to, you're not going to be right more than six or seven times out of 10. But what matters is when you are, not how many times you're right or wrong, but when you are right, how much you end up making money. If you buy a portfolio of all the well-studied large caps and they end up making 10, 12% or 13% IRR, you need to be right nine out of 10 times. In our investment business, and we have been doing this for now almost quarter to six years, we have been right only in 56% of the decisions that we have made, but we have still delivered close to 23, 24% IRR return to our investors right from day one. Uh, in an era where small cap indexes delivered 12 because when we were right, we ended up making absolutely high returns uh, on those investments. And when we were wrong, we did not end up losing a lot of capital on that. Those are the primary two theses based on which our investment hypothesis works. And also being the category that we are, uh, which is small cap, we will tend to be a lot more volatile. Um, we will we will average go up much more than the index and, and we will also go down more than the index. Um, we are perfectly okay with it, but an investor who invests with us, with our philosophy, should also be okay with it. Otherwise, it's just not a correct match. So if you look at the divergence between small cap and mid cap till now, this year, it's actually much higher. But if you look at the valuation gap, Today, the valuation gap is 31%, whereas the long-term average is close to 35%. So we're still, we're still roughly in the same region. There is no large discount to buying a small cap today uh, than what it was probably any time over the last five years. There have been instances where the discounts have been higher, like 2018-19, where the discounts went to as high as like 40-45%. And that's just a more macro view. At that point, if you would have thrown darts on stocks, you would have made money on, on like 75% of those. Going to specific examples of different indexes and how to read those indexes at what point and when they outperform. Like from the chart, you can clearly see there is an era of outperformance 
from 2000 FY13 to FY19. That is when your PVs were growing 4%, your CVs were growing 5%, your two wheelers were growing 8%. And the steel was at the bottom, and these guys were making a killing. You you saw them doing very very well as an industry, and and which also reflected in valuation. The index was probably one of the best performing index, um, which reversed due to steel margin pressure. And post in last one one and a half years, the volumes also significantly falling. Uh, we did not have not seen FY19 numbers. Uh, in any of the three segments in last three years, there is. We hope and we believe that we will start seeing a part of those numbers in FY twenty three and FY twenty four. And this is an area which has not done well, and for obvious reasons. And the valuations are in our favor. So this is the cycle that we need to think about and find out ideas and investments in this area. Same with banks and bank Nifty. If you look at, they used to trade at significant premium to Nifty from 2016 to 2019. Post IL and FS, some of these in uh, companies have taken a significant beating, uh, and and now with the merger of HDFC and HDFC Bank, the D rating seems to have taken another course, and they still now today uh, trade at a discount uh, uh, to uh, Bank Nifty. um we think this is one of those rare occasions where that is happening and in our mind this is a very reasonable opportunity to to look at some of the strong balance sheets in this industry if you were to look at it and and this is one very significant area so it uh, started getting derated from fy15 fy16 where Uh, the earnings growth of some of these companies tapered out, uh, 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 and growth was high single digit, and which completely reversed in in FY twenty one and twenty two, where the growth significantly picked up. We think this is a very risky area to look at today. Even after some correction, they still traded a premium to Nifty in terms of price to earnings, and there will be supply side issues and there will be margin concerns. so we would want to avoid this sector at this point nifty metal is actually another good sector to look at uh, and this is probably the most volatile sector in in that respect um, they true they traded at like 30% discount 35% uh, actually 60% discount to nifty uh, when the iron ore ban came Uh, uh then the discount completely narrowed down because of steel price import duty being uh, being put in and and you we saw all the optimism being priced in probably few months back uh before government announced another duty as i said almost all of the ferrous and non ferrous stocks peak out much before the earnings the stocks so we will be kind of a really a little bit of jittery to kind of go into this segment Nifty Pharma. This is one more case where massive re-rating happened due to and and you look at one time book became one point six times of Nifty book um, over a five year period. So there was sixty percent re-rating happening uh, due to strong U.S. market, strong growth, and the divergence started going back when. you had vendor consolidation and double digit price erosion offsetting volume growth in us market this is one industry we are we are still not clear on because the vendor consolidation is not going anywhere and the price erosions are still continuing but at a valuation level there is very little to lose from here is is a basic premise as of now after looking at a broader indexes and stocks and and where the business cycles are uh, we also think it's extremely important to keep questioning what your thesis and to have a 10th man in your team who can question those thesis for you so uh, so there is this movie world wars where there is a zombie attack on the world but but israel as a country knew about this because they had this concept of of 10th man we essentially want and 
and do have a person in our team who takes care of this part of the job i'll just uh, play this this is a longish clip but i'll i'll just play probably a few seconds the problem with most people is that they don't believe something can happen until it already has it's not stupidity or weakness it's just human nature how did you know your old lane Wrote a self-defeating Jeremiah about his employer, the UN, back in 2010. Caused a few ripples, sidelined your career. Thought you'd have parlayed those ripples into a self-righteous book. No knows for profit. How did Israel know? We intercepted a communique from an Indian general saying they were fighting the Urekshasha. Translation, zombies. Technically, undead. Jürgen Warmbrom, high-ranking official in the Mossad, described as sober, efficient, not terribly imaginative. And yet, you build a wall because you read a communique that mentions the word zombie? Well, if put like that, I'd be skeptical as well. In the 30s, Jews refused to believe they could be sent to concentration camps. In 72, we refused to fathom we'd be massacred in the Olympics. In the month before October 1973, we saw Arab troop movements and we unanimously agreed they didn't pose a threat. Well, a month later, the Arab attack almost drove us into the sea. So we decided to make a change. Change? The 10th man. If nine of us look at the same information and arrive at the exact same conclusion, it's the duty of the 10th man to disagree. No matter how improbable it may seem, the tenth man has to start digging with the assumption that the other nine are wrong. And you were that tenth man. Precisely. So I think as an industry and as investors, we tend to essentially extrapolate what is happening and what is probable. Um, and our, what is our experience over last 12 months, 18 months, 24 months and try and extrapolate it and which is where an opportunity happens, right? So this is exactly where you need a slightly more sharper thinking and somebody who doesn't think the same way as you do to kind of interject this whole thought process and, and, uh, and, and this, is, this is where we think our team is very good at. So let's take different sectors. I thought I thought we'll take cement sector because this is probably the most talked about sector in the last few months uh, after one of one large MA deal. So if you think about what happened in cement sector in the first decade of the of the of the of the first decade of the century, they grew at like 66% CAGR on the bottom line. And last 10 years, their their PBT has hardly grew. And on top of that, the valuation today has been derated to pre-2002 timeframes uh, on EV to capacity basis. I mean, you have some of these companies trading at the lowest valuation that they've traded in the last five years. We think this is a good area to start looking. Same with EPC. You had everybody and their mother doing this as an industry 10 years back. Today, you hardly have anybody in this industry where today India's infrastructure capex is at an all-time high, order books are at an all-time high, and you see hardly any good players with decent balance sheets ready to do this job. Uh, we think there is significant risk reward in our favor when we look at this industry. Same with capital goods. Capital goods saw almost 20% top line growth and 37, 36, 37% bottom line growth um, in the first uh, decade of the century. And last one decade has been a wipeout. These guys have essentially shrunk their balance sheet, have shrunk their PNL. And if there is any incremental order book and order growth, which we think is happening, uh, these guys are going to have the best times of their lives over the next three to four years. Chemical sector is a different sector where it has done well in the first decade also and it is continuing to do say well in the second decade. But the valuations here have gone sky, had gone actually sky high. There is some correction, 
but i think there is still some more correction to go in this sector before we uh, start taking large active bets in this sector we have no doubt or we have no uh, uh, we surely think that this sector has large upside to come uh, but as a business but as stock some of these have run ahead way ahead of the valuation and you will be very very cognizant and very very defensive when it comes to this sector um now i'll be you know more than happy to take any questions you guys have um and uh, you know make this a little more interactive and there are some very interesting questions are lined up i'll go uh, take one by one and more questions are welcome from the participants we will answer as much as possible in a given time and the first question is on the demographic uh, advantage of india india has more than 50% of its population uh, uh, who are uh, less than 25 more than 65% below the age of 35 do you think there is no advantage here uh, absolutely do you think this democracy demographic advantage will aid equity returns in the upcoming decade so if you go back to the absolute uh, first principles of economics the biggest driver of any economic growth in any segment of any country like you think about the first industrialized nation or you think about the uh, the richest country probably 5 centuries back it was mesopotamia the the first drivers of that are is population and then how you think about the and how you channelize that population into economic growth is a is a is a secondary uh, question we think we have all the characteristics to to have great growth but i think there are some road blocks and there are some challenges uh, to this economic growth there there needs to be much faster reforms than what it has been there needs to be um and again these are these a lot of these are more macro trends but i think we to answer a question a little succinctly we do have all the all the things required to have decent economic growth and be the fastest growing economy for next decade but we still need to put a lot of things in place before that becomes a reality i get into the next question here and how different is your research approach in the under researched small cap uh, sector as you have showcased uh, outlandish performance in the sector how different you are from others is what uh, an investor wants to know so so we are far more i would say value chain focus so we look at when we look at company we don't look at a company in isolation we look at we meet the suppliers the distributors uh we meet them uh we meet their ex employees and try and find out about the company lot more and why the company is creating the value that it is creating for a longer period of time and and why it should continue to do that so we have lot more grounds up approach and 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 which is what kind of differentiates us the second also our research is uh, also takes a lot of cognizance of of last 5 10 year performance and whether this is a one off or not and we look at all the accounting changes um uh, so so we have a lot of things we look at both at the at the pnl and balance sheet level and does it match on the ground level what the company is is doing and we are able to do that because we have a fairly concentrated portfolio and we don't have to do that for like 40 50 companies we have to do that for like 25 30 companies and keep doing it and and kind of invest in 10 15 companies uh which is what gives us an edge vis a vis a lot of others you run a non model portfolio can you throw some light what it is so that it will benefit the viewers so non model portfolio is pretty simple so today if you were to give money to a lot of large mutual funds or 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 any mutual fund or large pmss what tends to happen is that they have a model portfolio and you give them money on day 1 in the morning or whatever in the evening or afternoon they invest in the model portfolio in the proportion that they have we believe that a lot of stocks especially in small caps which tend to be far more volatile there is a buy zone there is a hold zone and there is a sell zone of a stock 
a stock which is in the hold zone does not necessarily be have to be bought in a new money that we get so we will only buy which represents significant value for our investors today which is why uh, we will end up buying stocks uh, not everything what we own but only a part of what we own and which is why we will take 3 to 6 months to deploy the whole capital that we get from new investors Uh, to maximize then try and maximize the returns for our new investors irrespective of what time they come into our portfolio this well explained and the next question what attributes your top of chart performance over long periods five years and seven months is a, a really good period uh, to assess and according to you how different is equilias compared to other fund houses including the mutual fund so two three things right we will so why we have done well i think there is a very um uh, i think we have done well because we have not we are we were not scared to put our or stick our neck out in a very non consensus under researched companies and buy significant positions in those companies based on our research we have had winners like alkyl amine or apl apollo or suven or polycap and and some of these companies have done very well for us in the past because um, when we bought they were extremely under researched but they were market leaders in their space and they were gaining market share and they were available at 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 very low valuation also the second reason i think why we have done well is is because we are not valuation agnostic we are very very valuation conscious so we will not buy things at any pe which we think gives us a significant edge over some of the larger pairs which are far more valuation agnostic uh, so those are i think two major reasons why uh, we will do significantly better than the market in a rising market and because our stocks are non consensus it may fall also a little more when the market is falling but on a longer period of time we think we can create wealth by doing the same the next question viraj and what are all the different stock selection methodologies that you adopt in a sideways market and according to you what are all the current hot themes which you have explained actually can you uh, the hot themes you have already shared and uh, the selection methodology is there like 2000 and how you narrow down and how you how do you do that so i don't think there is any difference in how i used to look at stocks and companies 3 4 years back or how do i look at it today i think the company generally has to be a market leader in its space has to keep gaining market share um and those are very simple things to look at and has to have a pristine balance sheet um and has to continuously showcase why it should exist and and thrive going forward um and you need decent valuations for you to look Uh, for you to buy that stock at that price those are very simple matrices very simple things to look at um and i think if you keep doing that over and over again um we will end up and we'll still make mistakes in some of them but i think we'll still end up with a reasonable cagr at the at a portfolio level the next question is in a upward trending rate cycles he means the interest uh, rate cycles how do the small caps behave historically compared to the large and mid caps so in historically if you look at it in an increasing rate environment small caps definitely get beaten up much more because the overall money gets moved out of equities on an average because a decent allocation then starts moving towards debt uh when that happens small caps tend to be far less liquid and they get beaten up more which is what we think creates a lot of opportunity and you can look at across rate hikes uh, whether it happens in 2013 or 2000 and uh, i mean whenever that has happened in the past it has created opportunities but in the shorter term small caps tend to fall more than large caps and it's just the way it is the government reforms uh, be it uh, uh, gst or uh, china plus one pli everything everyone thinks it is advantage large and mid caps and do small caps uh, make advantage of those uh, government reforms so i think it's a misnomer that if you are a small cap company listed on stock exchange you are a small company right uh so let's say if you are a small bank 
um you are definitely small because you have your larger brothers like hdfc bank or icici who can who can really like take away your lunch but let's say if you are a largest producer of cables in the country or if you are the largest producer of aliphatic amines in the country or if you are the largest jewelry retailer after titan in the country or in that specific area or if you are the largest gaming company in the country you may still be small cap on the stock exchanges but in your business you are really the big brother till you are essentially the big brother in your industry in top 2 3 4 players in your industry and your gaming market share i don't think it is it is it, it matters whether you are small or mid cap on the stock exchange it is essentially the business performance which will drive this and and not your market capitalization on the china plus uh, particularly is it a secular theme for chemicals you are bullish and in your presentation they were uh, good in the past and they are good now also and we have only about 4% of uh, uh, world share in the chemicals is what uh, uh, the viewer is thinking do you think uh, it can be a, in the longer run it can be a secular theme because he, he is fearing china being a country of uh, ruled by about 12 people and they can roll back the policy and will it affect uh, uh, the the chemical sector so um, i think i think what has happened in china plus one i think a lot of large mnc's have started looking for a second partner out of india so even a small shift what has already started happening continues will not affect china a lot but which will affect india a lot because that 1% or 2% pie on a 4% is an extremely large addition to india also the second thing we need to consider is is once a new channel partner is introduced it's not as if you can every day just change uh, and people have become far more conscious on on having multiple uh, partners in the in the system rather than just having the cheapest partner in the system i think people have learned their lesson in covid um, so we're not going back to the china hegemony anytime soon having said that i think the business dynamics look reasonably good and beat a quarter here and there as far as uh, margins are concerned but but the valuations even today are reasonably high for a lot of these chemical players so business performance may not translate into stock performance in near term is is our opinion on this the next question is on the cements in the recent times cement stocks have fallen like nine pence on excess capacity on 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 consolidation do you think infra and cement sector is a long story long term story plus will you will you go for where is the opportunity in the small cap space when uh, grasms of this world three cements dominates the sector so uh, great question i think large money in cement historically has been made when cement moves a company moves from 10 million tons to 30 40 50 million ton capacity uh, we have seen that happening in valuation re-rating when she cement moved from a 10 million ton to 60 million ton and going ahead it plans to go higher uh, dalmia bharat the same case jk cement the same case um, we believe that will continue to happen also to think that a competitor comes see it can happen in a telecom industry where one competitor can essentially um, um, you know close down everybody else's shop we think it's a very far fetched thought um, that one competitor coming in and buying two players can ruin an entire industry build over 25 years um, but the valuation today suggests that so and you see promoter buying happening in a, in a lot of such companies i am not saying look at only small cap i think even large cap cement today represents a lot of value um also don't look at small cap which intend to remain small cap don't look at a 10 million ton company which intends to remain a 10 million ton company even 5 years out but look at a 10 million ton company which wants to become a 30 million ton and then see whether they can execute that or not and the question follow up question is from graj and uh, if the valuations are attractive will it get into large caps also if it is required in the fund yeah yeah why not i i i i see my fund doesn't say it's a small it's 
it will only buy small and mid cap right it says long horizon fund and which is very very valuation conscious and um, if there is lot of money to be made in large caps i wouldn't mind buying it the only caveat what tends to happen is because large caps are very well tracked see if there is a large discount in large cap my ability to assess whether it's a one time problem or or whether something is structurally wrong with it is very low because it's been tracked by 50 100 200 people on the street when it comes to a small cap we think we have a significant advantage over everybody else on the street so our confidence also in that stock is is far higher having said that if an opportunity still tends to happen we will we'll be more than happy to look at it First, RBI raised 40 bips, and uh, yesterday, the day before yesterday, again 50 bips has been increased. On a raising uh, inflation and uh, the interest rates, do you think housing as a theme has really made a comeback after a decade of uh, bad performance? Do you think is it secular is what uh, uh, an investor? See, we just discussed that no theme is secular for 10 years in this country. all teams work for 3 to 5 years and you got to know what valuation you are going to pay for that if you look at uh, uh, the consolidation which is happening in real estate sector if you look at some of the larger players and the launch pipelines i think important factor here to notice is what companies are placed in sweeter spot and sweeter city cities uh, like some of the metro cities and who are majority coming from those metro cities and they have clean balance sheet and a road map of growth over next 3 to 4 years and the valuations are in our favor so we would look at something like a belvedere like a godrej properties which would be like at a significant premium uh, to its book value but there are companies which are trading at 3 or 4 times their ebitda two or three years out um, and we think there is a lot of value in some of those real estate stocks till today we have only invested in real estate through some of the ancillary plays like cables etc etc but we wouldn't mind going direct as well if we if we find couple of good opportunities you have answered this question the next question what is your right to wrong ratio what he means is you i said i think you have been right in like 56% or something yeah you answered that and uh, it is one of the important factors to avoid the uh, risk of uh, skewed returns suppose you select 10 stocks all the return comes from few stocks uh, how do you avoid that when you cut positions and uh, what is your that's that's nature of business right it's very difficult to do that in small caps um uh i would say it's not a bug it is how the system is designed you will we will invest in 15 stocks out of which i would say 3 or 4 or 5 will not make money 3 or 4 will make very average money one or two make very decent money 30 40% irr and one or two will make outlandish money that is a feature of the system and not a bug but that is how you make big money in small cap investing you you look at all the large successful small cap investors they have all made money because they let their winners run and 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 cut their losers which is how we intend to do as well an investor wants to know is it value buying you do based on pe and or price to book or pg or on bad news i think it's a little bit of both everything right it's not either or it's 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 you need everything in this to go right uh, for you to make money i i don't think it's this or this or that i think is this and this and this and that but if i were to think about our philosophy in one line it will be grow that reasonable price what is your exit policy and on the downside or on the upside on the upside there is no exit policy till the company keeps doing well um and the returns from there become very narrow that is when we sell we only essentially sell on three reasons one if the initial business thesis was incorrect to begin with uh, b if we think uh, the business is performance is not up to the mark and what we thought and and see if there is a corporate governance issue 
those are the only three reasons um, we sell a stock for next one is on the cash calls and uh, yeah what is your uh, outlook uh, when do you take cash calls do you uh, on a steep drawdown expected do you uh, come out and stay in cash to re enter when the sentiment uh, gets better no, what is your uh, outlook on cash we don't understand that so we don't take cash calls um i will leave that to the end investor I, see if we start doing that then it also defeats the whole purpose because essentially an investor is giving us money to buy good stocks what we still do do is buy companies which are reasonably priced and we take time to buy them but we don't take cash calls because our job is not asset allocation that's an investor's job Uh, or a wealth manager's job. If we start doing that, then there will be multiple cash calls taken at multiple places at the end investor level and at the fund level, which defeats the whole purpose of asset allocation to begin with. Is there a matrix by which you limit your uh, single stock uh, in the portfolio? Is there a percentage beyond that? No, you do not go. We we don't go about ten percent at book value for any stock. Next one is from I mentioned his name here for a difference. He calls himself N R. What makes the sector cement E P C to go up? What does the future trigger is what uh, he wants to know. The only thing which makes these companies go up is earnings. Everything else is is not right. So earnings of these companies, why should it go up? Because we are looking at record capex. We are looking at record capex both government and private. And on top of that, significant supply side crunch. See, even if there is record capex, but there are hundreds of companies doing these jobs, you will not have these companies make a lot of money, and the balance sheet will be bloated. But today, you have less bloated balance sheet because the competition has just run dry. So you have very few players doing specific jobs and making very reasonable money, and earnings being upgraded, which is why some of these companies should make reasonable money. Same investor wants to know what what is your sortino ratio? Which ratio? Sortino. I have no clue. Fine. I don't even know what that means actually. <laughs> And uh, uh, how do you handle bad sentiment? Not in favor of excellent valuation. Will you still invest? Actually, you have answered for this. And uh, next question is on the IT branch. Uh, yes, okay. IT is going through a uh, very benign time. It had, and after that, uh, uh, on uh, b- bad sentiments and uh, uh, when uh, the, the, the margins are shrinking, uh, the expectation is they will not spend for IT. What is your outlook in the longer run? when the valuations have come down still you said it is not at uh, no, they are still at the average they are at a premium to five year averages also a lot of mid cap it company saw a lot of discretionary spend happening from uh, some of the smaller and larger guys in us i think with recession being imminent or i would say propagated i don't know us but whatever i read a recession seems imminent imminent and some of these projects will become softer pipelines for especially some of the mid cap players and there will be supply side pressure for for them because the wage hikes have happened and wages have gone up and attrition is at record level so everything that can go wrong there are multiple things which can go wrong for some of these smaller players i think larger players still have the ability somebody like a tcs and infosys has ability to navigate through this is significantly higher than some of the smaller players uh, and but even their valuations are are reasonably high so but you may not see large price correction in some of these but but mid cap it still represents large pocket where we think significant price erosion can happen even from here every expert in the street says uh, banking is uh, Uh, ready for investments and uh, it is at a attractive valuation. You have contra call reasons uh, uh, an investor wants. Why are you not touching banks now? No, I think banks will do very well. I never said banks will not do well. My only point is that smaller banks will not do well. I think larger guys will keep. So 
larger guys will keep eating the pie in banking and and see you don't need me to invest in an icici or an axis or an hdfc bank i'm sure you can buy a banking etf at very little cost you don't need to pay me 2 and a half 3% to buy banking for you i think larger banks will continue to do well and i'm no doubt in that but for that you don't need me so which is why they are not there in the portfolio okay they understand and uh, next question is okay uh, on on what basis if the sentiments are good still not uh, the stock is not performing what is your tolerance period uh, uh, in very which tolerant. to very tolerant we have kept a stock for 4 years without z- with zero return in the fifth year it became like a 4x 5x so we are fairly tolerant we are not tolerant if the business performance is out of sync if the business is performing but the stock is not a fairly okay with it the next question is very interesting man is there any change in the investing philosophy as you have ran for first to 6 years the fund and what is your biggest learning and success and failures in the last 6 years great question yeah so i think i think what has happened is i was only a valuation investor probably 6 7 8 years back we look at businesses far more minutely now than what we did probably 6 years back and we do post mortem or pre mortem of what can go wrong with businesses far more minutely than what we did probably 6 years back um which is our biggest learning that no price is too low for a bad business it's not as if you want to pay the top dollar for a good business but for a bad business no price is too low so that's been our biggest learning there have been investments in companies like tcpl packaging and a couple more they have ended up losing like 30 35% 40% on a stock which were not great businesses available at very cheap valuation um but without growth so and it was an obvious learning for us in the past if i look at it but there were some tuition fees we paid for it in a time like this your fund accepts sip is what uh, stp he is asking sip is not possible sir and uh, stp is are possible 50 lakh is the minimum investment and uh, stp do you allow uh, viraj yeah yeah i will do allow stp the next question is this is not the related to your uh, presentation what is the nr again is asking what is your view on platform companies paytm uh, uh, zomato nike india mart kind of a company i think very few of these companies are profitable i wouldn't touch companies which are not profitable and they do not have a path to profitability in 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 even medium term um and the valuation even today of most of these companies are absolutely out of sync with reality i think it will take a lot of time for me to be even look at the and and look at the opportunities that exist in our market otherwise yeah? i don't see a reason for us to spend money uh, 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 on on uh, or spend time on these companies what is the earnings growth of your portfolio in the past 3 uh, years so, and what so, is your prediction is what uh, and so i think earnings growth of our portfolio since inception is closer to 18% um and the portfolio return is um, at gross of fees because that's what you got to measure net of fees is 23% gross of fees is in 25 and a half 26% so the 6 7% cagr return has come due to pd rate and in in investor is asking i have uh, money of 50 lakhs and uh, do you think uh, what what i should do is for it is very generic if you could answer you answer no, i don't know you give your money to shiva and let him decide what he wants to do with it um uh, can you shed some light on agrochemical space is what prakash singhal is asking yeah extremely interesting space i think large amount of capex has happened by multiple companies be it make money bharat rasayan pi some of the large players have done large capexes uh, i think that will come to fruition uh, 
just have to be very careful because a lot of these agrochemical and I mean technical manufacturers are very richly valued today, um, and anything which can go wrong uh, will harm uh, the returns from this point of view. So, but business wise, I think they are in a very sweet spot. This question is from Kunal. Good corporate government governance plays a key role for making returns, especially in small caps. How do you gauge the corporate governance for small cap, which is a difficult job? It's a very generic question. I would say corporate governance is important across the portfolio, but I think corporate governance is a very grey area, right? All businesses have some or either or, or here and there a little bit of grey area. We are not okay with absolute theft, but high salary of the promoter, I think we are completely fine with such things. I mean, high salary of promoter, even Wipro takes pay CEO 78, 80 crores, right? So we are completely fine with, with some, of, some of these things. I, I think corporate governance is, is actually also, and, and this is a little controversial statement, but is also cyclical. When the businesses are doing well, people tend to forgive corporate governance mistakes of the past. It is only when the business is not doing well, corporate governance comes to the fore. So I think till the business is not absolute thief, um, I think it is in the interest of the promoter also to not really take out money. I think everybody wants valuation, right? So um, I think we don't really get the most pristine businesses. But we are not okay with the bottom 35, 40 percentile businesses. We are okay with the top half of the businesses. Mr. Sachdev is asking this. I read out for you. What do you make of uh, cramps, domestic focused and API pharma companies in terms of market and business cycles respectively? Would you say cramps are relatively insulated to Cy uh, is yeah. it cyclical is what he is asking. I think I think API has gone through big trouble in the last six months. Um, I think the bottom is near, both business-wise. I think Q1 may be the bottom as far as business is concerned now, and it can vary a quarter here and there according to the companies that you look at. But you're absolutely right, both in terms of business and valuation, these companies have created a bottom. Not that they will get back their frothy valuation what they got two years back. It's very, um, it's not good to assume that. So only look at companies where even on a normalized earning basis and normalized valuation basis, you make good money three years out. If that base case scenario exists, I think there are opportunities in that sector. This is a little stock specific and uh, we avoid the stock specific questions. Uh, this one question I'm taking. You said you have Suen in your portfolio. And I yeah. And uh, 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 what do you, Divis has come to a reasonable valuation is what uh, someone wants to. Yeah, no, but I used to have. I don't have it anymore. I, as I said, don't want to go stock specific. It will be endless. And, uh, uh, in this troubled time where the volatility is uh, very high, Virat, what is the general message you want to give for your current investors who have put money in Equirias and people who are considering to put uh, money into Equirias? What is your message? You don't get good prices and good uh, news at the same time. Today, there is bad news and there is good prices. I don't know whether the prices can fall more. Of course it can. I mean, 10% can fall any given day, uh, but you don't get both good prices and good news. You should put money on bad news. If you don't want to put everything up front, um, put uh, like do STP, as you rightly said. Also, anybody who has given us money should think about us as a four or five year partner. Anything less than that, we are not the right investors. Viraj, uh, you have answered all the questions very well and in fact it is very informative. Thank you very much uh, for taking time for PMS Bazaar to attend uh, this webinar. And the investors must have also learned a great bit uh, from your presentation and the uh, q &A. I want to thank uh, the investors and the team uh, Equirias. Thank you very much for your evening Viraj and the participants.
thank you thank you so much everyone who's come and thank you so much shiva for this opportunity thank you so much